So welcome everybody. Welcome to this, our University of Adelaide Ecology and Evolution series. So this is the last of our winter series. Um, and for winter, we've been focusing on conservation technology. So we're super excited that for this, our last conservation technology session, we've got two fantastic speakers. So we're going to be hearing from uh, Ramesh, Raja Sagaran, and also from Amelie Janelle. So um, let me, first of all, before we hear from our speakers, let's um, just recap to look at, looking at my slides, um, just think about the, the aims of this seminar series. So this series was set up um, with a focus on um, just creating connection. So it's about um, being curious, it's about being cutting edge and bringing people together um, around environmental science. So we're really keen to to keep building this global community of environmental science. And um, it's great to have this conservation technology focus um, for this series. But uh, Ramesh is, is known for his exciting work around um, drones particularly, so spatial science, um, really well, ex well, well um, respected around that and is the director for what we call the drone hub. So Ramesh can tell you more about that, but the drone hub here at University of Adelaide and doing some exciting, really innovative work around spatial science. So Ramesh, I will hand over to you. Tell us what you've been up to. Your awesome Thank you very slides. much. I do have the coolest job in the world. Uh, sometimes I stop and remind myself that. Um, okay, so can you see my screen? Is it there? Yes. Uh, excellent, and a pointer as well, I hope. Can you see me yep. moving my pointer? Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Good. All right. So um, thanks, Jasmine. Uh, it's really good to be here. I do only have 20 minutes. Is that right? And five minutes question time? Just to double check. All right, cool. Uh, I will talk a little bit quickly then. <laughs> I could talk for ages about this stuff. Um, so this picture over here is Molly out in the field with um, fix, setting up uh, three thermal cameras on a large drone at four in the morning to go out looking for feral cats on Kangaroo Island. Unfortunately, I won't be talking about any of that. I just think it's a really cool image. Um, but what I will be talking about is um, sort of the state of play of, of drones as a monitoring tool um, based on unmet, the unmanned research aircraft facilities um, experiences. So not comprehensive, but I'm just sort of using a bunch of case studies to sort of demonstrate how drones can be used as a tool um, and my background's in remote sensing and GIS and um, the, the concepts behind remote sensing for environmental monitoring are really well established. Um, there have been a good couple of speeches uh, in the past from Megan Lewis and um, Mickey Wang about some interesting remote sensing um, problems and um, I believe Emily will be talking a little bit about that stuff as well. But right now with drones there's like this massive range of payloads and the number is growing. There's a lot of tech out there to be able to do these things. Um, and they're basically using established techniques that have been established in satellite and conventional airborne um, platforms uh, as um, a way of being able to monitor environments. The problem is that when you have smaller sensors that are typically also cheaper normally and um, you're working in extreme resolutions that there are some pretty novel problems. When you've got novel problems, you sort of have to really ask yourself the question is, is the tech adoptable for my work in terms of what my monitoring requirements are? Or would I actually have to spend a lot of my time uh, and research um, focusing on the tech itself to get it to work, to do the things that you want to? Now, there's, that's not a value judgment in any way whatsoever. It's more a matter of how mature the technology is and how easy it is to be able to implement something like that or whether you want to nerd out and do some cool stuff with new tech. Um, yeah. So it's a good idea to sort of know the state of play because if you're dipping your turn to some fast moving tech, uh, there can be some dire consequences if you don't know what you're doing. You really do want to have um, a fairly smooth transition uh, that makes you look pretty groovy in red jeans. I do love those pants. Um, but today, so there's a lot of things that we can talk about. I'm going to focus entirely on just mapping stuff with drones. 
Um, so uh, RGB or visual, visible spectrum imaging, um, multispectral and hyperspectral, um, and I will be limiting my sort of experience to, uh, well, my talk to the experiences that I've got with um, solutions that are basically less than $100,000. Because let's face it, this is environmental monitoring. <laughs> Um, so with RGB imagery, it's pretty good stuff to use for identifying and counting things and using your eyes and um, the way that we see the world to visualize things and identify those things, the, the objects that we're interested in. Whereas with spectral um, imaging, you're mapping and measuring vegetation dynamics. Um, and with hyperspectral, you're sort of really looking at trying to do species discrimination and disease detection. And Mickey talked about that a fair bit in the previous talk. I'll kind of talk about the hardware, the software and the skills necessary to be able to, to um, that's where those things are and how much is necessary to be able to get um, a monitoring uh, program up using things uh, using a method that NASA developed called technology readiness levels, which is basically a way of just sort of measuring or at least reporting against how um, how mature the technology is and how much effort is required to get something up and running. I bastardized it a little bit um, and uh, got my own uh, or a dem a ad adaptation from another paper. Um, to talk about these where basically green and nine is you can put it up without a huge amount of effort and cost to um, the lower the number gets, the more effort and um, bravery you have to have to implement something like that. I am gonna run through a few um, case studies quickly in terms of just showing you the types of data you can get out of it and the types of information you can extract from it sharing some of my pain and some of my joy. Um, so with Mutton Cove, um, this is a project that I um, started off in 2019, 2018 with Alice Jones. Dylan did a lot of the work with this one, um, where basically there's a conservation reserve um, out in Northern Adelaide, um, where there's a breach in the seawall over here that's letting in a whole lot of water and turning this um, predominantly salt marshy area into um, uh, an area where mangrove is starting to um, recolonize. We've been measuring that for a while, but identifying where salt marsh is living or dying can be quite difficult with just using visible techniques in, in, um, in, out of the imagery. So we mapped this area with multi-spec and uh, multi-spectral imagery and um, tried to classify the different types of cover that's in this area, in the northern area and in the south, where using just basically largely just photosynthetic activity, the differences between mangrove, live salt marsh and dead salt marsh or bare soil. And it's come up really well and allowed us to be able to sort of quite reliably, I've got a crash, there you go, hang on a sec. Mm -hmm. Sorry about this, folks. Okay. Um, to over time be able to watch the progress of um, salt marsh and mangroves from 2018, where there wasn't a huge amount of mangrove and growing through to um, quite a decent amount of uh, mangrove seedlings. Um, you'll probably hear about this from Hamish Heath and his work out here on seedlings and its distribution. Um, there's not a huge amount of information here. I just wanted to show you that over, the, t over the, the time of the study, we've seen a huge amount of change and measured it quite well in terms of looking at where live salt marsh has started growing, where live salt marsh has died and where there hasn't been any change and they've done the same thing for um, mangroves. And we're looking at being able to measure the amount of area and where those things have happened. Um, over space and time using sort of three centimeter imagery. Um, and that's pretty exciting stuff. I can tell you that it started off being a very difficult thing in 2018 and has turned into something that has um, become a fairly straightforward procedure of, of capturing the imagery, processing it and getting the information out. Largely because the cameras are small, easy to use. There are integrated units that you can use where it's all one 
solid system that you can put up in the air without a huge amount of effort or training. With that in mind, I give the aircraft uh, a solid nine in terms of it being easily implementable and already is in many industries. Um, payloads, easy to use as well. Um, the software is very mature. It uses old remote sensing techniques and um, many of those things are still applicable using drone imagery. Um, and the operation requires a little bit of training and skill um, and the analysis just a little bit more, but largely it's using fairly um, well-established techniques that you've got a lot of literature and, and manuals to, to um, operate with. Hyperspectral is a slightly different story where you need a large aircraft and the level of, um, I guess, what's the word for it? customization or bespoke solutions that you need to be able to do this is evident in how many wires and cables you're seeing hanging off the uh, bottom of my aircraft. Um, it is large um, and can take a lot of time and effort to be able to get up and running and integrated into an aircraft, um, but poses a lot of very interesting potential. And we've tried that with this project that we were doing with, for SA Water. Um, this is Alice Jones, Ken Clark, and Milena from SA Water. And URF, the whole team, was involved in this one, um, looking at um, a feasibility study for how uh, new technologies or different aircraft drone imaging technologies could be used to map seagrasses. It was basically a study in how difficult uh, different solutions. And we did a couple of different things. I'm only talking about the hyperspec in this one. Um, but basically, um, the, the concept of, of, the, of the dealing with the environment and the challenges that that presents um, was a significant uh, thing that we were considering in terms of wind, water, um, sunlight and reflection, turbidity, those kinds of things solid concerns of ours um, as well as the regulations because flying off flying drones off the Adelaide metropolitan coast can be quite hairy and it can take a lot of people this is not council workers these guys are all doing things um, so I'm going to cut this short to showing how difficult it was to be able to get good data where you can see that this long strip over here um, is plagued with quite a lot of um, specular reflection from the ripples in the water. Um, this is an issue largely because we the, the technology is quite difficult to be able to operate and adjust in real time. You send it up, you go and grab some imagery, you bring it down and see you've done you see if you've done all right. And by that time, the environment has changed a little bit, so it makes it quite difficult. If you do have real time feeds of data, um, you can see that there's an issue with it. Um, and um, correct for it, but unfortunately, um, the tech is is sort of requires a fair bit of work to um, get to a point where you can start to capture good data reliably. Now, some people would say that we were um, foolhardy for going out and uh, flying a hyperspec that um, we were still learning how to use over water, um, and I don't think <laughs> anyone's going to defend our actions in any way whatsoever. It was good fun uh, and we learned a lot of things. Unfortunately, we didn't get a huge amount of good data. That's not to say that you can't get good data. Mickey, a couple of weeks ago, talked about um, how to capture great stuff um, for disease detection in, in um, uh, vineyards. Um, but I think to a large extent, what we're seeing is that with hyperspectral imagery off drones, um, though the, the, the aircraft is relatively well mature. The payload takes a lot of work to get to a point where we can actually get good information from. Data processing, you're still, you're using um, expert systems to, to get your information out, but they're relatively well um, matured based on, on um, uh, a good number of years, good couple of decades of um, hyperspectral processing and information extraction. But it does take a lot of skill um, uh, and, and a lot of trial and error to be able to get some good reliable data. And to a large extent, I think um, you're, you're still looking at hyperspectral um, imaging off drones as being something that can be implemented in, in industry and, and done reliably, but it does take um, a decent amount of expertise um, and a little bit of risk to be able to, to get what you want out of it.
I do want to talk now about some RGB mapping. Now, um, I'll, without going into what you can get out of um, visible mapping uh, too much, um, I'll give you a little bit of an understand, a bit of a background on on why we did this project in particular. Um, so this is part of the ARC. Um, Wheat Hub that um, I was a program leader for, um, where we basically built the skills necessary to to um, use drones for imaging um, high throughput wheat field phenotyping um, projects, where we worked with um, plant breeding community, uh, AGT Long Reach and Intergrain, to come up with methods of being able to reliably image um, uh, their um, field trials and to get metrics out that are useful for them to make good decisions as to whether they want to hold on to the numerous varieties of wheat that they've got within each of these plots. The, the project started off with um, us, well me, uh, a few years ago starting with RGB cameras going out and doing a lot of trial and error with a lot of bespoke solutions in aircraft um, and camera uh, combinations. That was five years ago. Now you can basically go into a Harvey Normans and grab a drone that's capable of being able to do that with an extremely mature solution. And we've been working with the wheat breeding industry to kind of um, advise them and train them on how to go out and capture good data um, and to be able to process it as well. And one of the things that they're really interested in is um, understanding how much um, canopy cover um, wheat their, their varieties are, um, are delivering through the course of the season. Now, um, in environmental monitoring context, these things aren't too dissimilar to um, grass. It is a grass. Uh, it's it's a perennial problem in terms of how much how much effort do you want to spend in extracting the information on how much canopy cover there is over here um, as to how much value it is to their decision making. Now, if you can do it reliably quickly um, and um, cheaply, then it starts becoming a proposition that's quite useful for them. Unfortunately, it takes, um, a, even though it looks quite obvious over here to the human eye as to where the canopy is, it is quite, it has been traditionally quite difficult to um, uh, extract that information using just RGB imagery, especially when there's differences in illumination conditions, shadow, background, soil, different types of vegetation around and all those kinds of things as well. But we've been working with Signal ML to come up with a solution to um, build a machine learning model to um, train that model and predict where the um, canopy is. And that's a process of going through a lot of this imagery and having uh, poor old Dylan go through uh, and uh, basically trace out where every little bit of canopy is in numerous of these tiles um, to be able to put into a model and train it into saying what, we, what we're looking for, which is in this, in this case, wheat, um, and to use that model to then predict where wheat uh, canopy is. And we've been really quite happy with the work um, that's come out of that um, in terms of now it's it's really exciting where RGB imagery has typically been quite difficult to be able to extract information from. It's been really good to interpret information but to automatically extract information has been problematic um, where we're looking at some pretty decent um, outcomes where you can now make um, pretty reliable um, uh, estimations of how much um, vegetation cover there is against um, bare soil and non-photosynthetic um, material. Pushed out to large areas, um, being able to do that quickly and efficiently um, is a pretty exciting thing for us. So my report card for RGB imagery is that the aircraft and payloads are extremely easy to use. You don't need a huge amount of skill to operate. Um, the advances in data processing software um, have made it quite reasonable for us to um, 
uh, share that knowledge and people be able to uptake that and even to just go on YouTube and go and learn how to do it. It's really quite a mature solution. So that's my quick rundown of the three different types of remote sensing that you can do with drones. There's other payloads um, everywhere from animal tracking. So these are sort of my ballparking of the TRL that those different technologies have at the moment where um, animal tracking, planning bots, spro drones, um, which I don't have any of, would like to play with. Um, LiDAR we've got, um, and uh, we're quite surprised at how mature that um, technology is, although the extraction of information can be a little bit challenging. Thermals, heaps of fun, but a lot of work to do. Um, and there are other new sensors that are coming out um, through the ranks, uh, such as gamma ray spectroscopy and um, radar. Another thing to take into consideration is that there's a growing ecosystem of supporting technologies um, like real-time kinematic GPS and other types of very precise GPS or positioning systems that help out with um, being able to uh, use really high resolution imagery and place it in with high accuracy into real world coordinates for really quite advanced um, spatial analysis. And as these things start coming about, um, there are data processing pipelines that, um, that start maturing as well in terms of being able to, if you've got fairly straightforward questions that you want to answer, ask of your data that everybody else wants to, you can build um, solutions where you can capture data, upload it to a service provider or to your own um, uh, local solution, have the data process really quickly and come back with information um, with a fair amount of um, speed and accuracy and affordability. Um, cool, so I guess I hope I've given you a little bit of a rundown on the project, I guess some of the developments of, um, uh, of the technology in recent times compared to, I guess there's not been much of a context setting. I've just given you a bit of a lay of the land of what things are at the moment. It's moving pretty quickly. Um, and I guess it's worth pointing out that um, only about three or four years ago, the technologies now that are looking like they're sitting at about eight or nine, we're sitting at about five, um, only a couple of years ago, basically where hyperspectral is now. Um, and uh, the uptake starting to um, happen at such a rate that there's, um, I guess, new pieces of information that you can take out of, of, of technologies that are rapidly maturing. And with monitoring, I guess, what I can say is that the best time to start monitoring was yesterday, but if there's anything here that you would like to talk about, um, we can talk about uh, how some of these technologies might be useful for you for your monitoring uh, requirements. Here's my contact details or your contact details. Um, yeah, please feel free to ask some questions. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much, Ramesh. Um, the, the amazing spread that you have as a group is um, inspiring and some, some great examples from the week through to that um, off-coast example. So thank you. So thank we'll tr yeah, throw it open to, um, to questions from either in the chat or um, yeah, to Ramesh directly. Uh, Ramesh Bertram here. If you look back like three or four years, um, what has been the most exciting new development? Ooh. I don't know, it's all pretty exciting. Um, I guess one of the things that's been surprising for, um, for me has been the, the rate at which the position, positioning systems have come online um, to give really high accuracy or highly precise um, positioning data so that you can start doing. So one of the biggest challenges that um, uh, I think that we've been facing has been trying to get data when you're monitoring over time to sit one on top of one another so that you can analyze differences. And that's been quite um, challenging. And I think that um, the systems that are supporting 
um, image capture, processing and analysis like um, RTK and uh, data processing pipelines that allow you to be able to upload data and get results back um, quickly would be to me one of the more exciting things because everyone wants to capture good data, no one wants to process the data. Um, and having those solutions mature has been pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Ramesh, Steve here. What Steve. can a drone do that a satellite can't do better? Um, apart from the cost. Apart from the cost, well, I don't know, satellite imagery is um, pretty cheap, really, uh, considering. I think the, the thing with, with drones is that you have full control of when you go out and image. Um, and if there's cloud cover, there are issues for, for satellite imagery. Um, it's a lot more of a bespoke solution. Um, but you, yeah, I, I guess that's the, that's, the, that's the easiest and quickest response to that is that you really are in control of when you go out, except for when there's bad weather, then no one's going out to do those kinds of things. But yeah, um, the resolution I think is still um, key, uh, where aerial photography is coming along incredibly with you know sub centimeter um, imagery, um, with satellite imagery coming down to you know the meter level. Um, but with some of the stuff that we've been working with, we're talking about five mil to one mil imagery. Um, which allows you to look for some pretty cool things as well. Are you saying something, Steve? No? No, thank you. That was all. Yep, cool. You can go now. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Do we have any um, last question, any closing questions for Ramesh before we hand, um, hand the ball on? I'd love to know, um, so what's your prediction in, in 10 years? What do you think you'll be uh, playing with then? And, what, and um, what are the exciting questions do you think that you'll be able to tackle as a group? In ten years' time. In ten years, oh uh, no, no, I, I'm struggling to keep up with the last twenty-four months of development. Um, it would be silly of me to to make uh, a claim on that. Um, I would say though that um, it would, yeah, depending on on uh, the public's um, appetite for it, quite autonomous systems going out and doing them. The vision collection is um, not too far away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well. it's about I think with with a lot of environmental monitoring as well as that in the past, not enough data has been the the problem, and now we're working through reams and reams of data to be able to pull out the information, and it's a sort of a new paradigm. Hmm. Yep, bit of a paradigm shift happening. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. That yeah, you know, we really appreciate Thanks exciting guys. stuff for now and and where you're heading. We yeah, look forward to seeing how that evolves in that space. So, thank thanks, Pete. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yep. big thumbs up uh, from everyone. I think so. Thanks and um, enjoy that soccer match. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for um yeah, thanks for being a great role model for lots of people. Mixing your science <laughs> with your soccer. That's pretty inspiring. And <laughs> just enjoy. All right. Thanks. Okay, so next up, so we have, um, yeah, is that going to work for us? All right, so we'll move on now to our second speaker. So Emily is a speaker, um, a student with us here at University of Adelaide who is just finishing up, so um, has just finished, I think perhaps Emily will be able to give us the update, her PhD with Professor um, Bertram Ostendorf. So another exciting group in the spatial science space here at um, the university. Um, so we're moving now to going underground. So Emily's work is around soil. We've had quite a lot of interest of people um, interested in, in um, Emily's research that she's about to share with us. So as we know, soil health is such an important issue and growing issue. 
So Emily has been looking at soil erosion, looking at wind and water erosion and trying to find the best technology to help us address those questions and management of that. So hand over to you, Emily. Tell us, what have you been finding? Okay. Okay, can everyone see it okay? Yes. Yep. Yeah. All good. So yeah, as Jasmine said, I um, just received results from my um, PhD thesis last week. It's been accepted, so that's pretty good. Um, and now I'm going to give you a very quick overview of what I've been doing for the past four years. Uh, although I'm not too sure 20 minutes is going to do it justice, but I'll try to do my best. Um, so I'm working on soil erosion modeling. So it's a little bit different from Ramesh, what Ramesh just presented. Um, I'm looking at a slightly, slightly larger scale, uh, which is the agricultural areas of South Australia. And the resolution is much coarser than what a drone can give you. Um, we're talking about um, uh, Moody's resolution, so it's uh, 500 meter pixels, but I'll talk a bit more about it later. So soils are pretty important for agriculture because um, you need healthy soils to be able to um, produce, produce crops and feed the world. So that's quite important. However, uh, soil erosion is still a major cause of land degradation around the world. And unfortunately, um, it's predicted to increase in frequency and intensity with extreme weather conditions, such as floods, droughts, and bushfires. So what is soil erosion? Um, soil erosion is a natural process where soil is detached by a driving force, which can be wind. So as the wind sweeps on the ground, it detaches particles that are transported upwards and deposited um, further downstream. Uh, downstream. And in, if it's sufficiently concentrated and it can create the storms. And the second driving force is water when, uh, when raindrop hit the ground, um, some soil particles are detached and then go into a concentrated flow, goes down slope and um, gets deposited at the bottom of hills. Soil erosion is highly variable through space and time, and it does not induce a linear response. So we need very detailed information to be able to predict erosion and find out where the erosion hotspots are. This might become more problematic in the future, especially with uh, an increase in compound events, um, recurrent drought, or extreme dust storm and reliable, unreliable rainfall. So I've got two examples here. Um, you might remember last year in Mildura, um, a dust storm swept through the town, went black in the matter of minutes. Um, there's another example closer to home. Um, on the Air Peninsula, so you can see dust coming from the desert, but also from the Colwell area. So all that valuable um, soil gets blown away. Of course, it gets deposited somewhere else, but where it's been taken off from, then you're at risk of um, decreasing your soil productivity. So what can we do about it? And that's where my project comes from. So I'm using a combination of satellite imagery and existing um, digital maps to look at this um, spatial and temporal variability in erosion. And because I only had three years, I um, focused on two major regions, which is the Air Peninsula and the Mid-North um, um, Lower Flinders Range area. So usually wind and water erosion are studied separately. So you're either a hydrologist or a soil physicist. So the idea of that project was to try to bring the two together. So I'm using a wind erosion model and those equations have been derived, mathematical equations have been derived from wind tunnel experiments and field work. It's combining information about wind speed, um, surface cover and the structure of vegetation, but also information on soil, such as soil moisture and soil erodibility. Because those um, equations and modeling was derived from field scale. Some parameters about vegetation especially are pretty hard to scale up. So until very recently, it was not really possible to apply those models in um, geographic information systems. 
but uh, in 2017, Chapel and Webb proposed a new approach to um, create, derive um, an empirical relationship between the structure of vegetation, which is the height and the breadth of vegetation, with the amount of shadow it produced, and created a new calibration equation, um, enabling the use of satellite imagery for wind erosion modeling, which was not really easy to implement until now. So um, I'm using uh, some MODIS product, which is called the um, MODIS Albedo product. For water erosion, the traditional approach is the universal soil loss, or USLE. Um, and it combines, again, information about weather. Here, it's rainfall. Vegetation cover, soil erodibility, the influence of uh, topography, and erosion control, which is any uh, land management that can prevent erosion. So this equation gives you an average um, amount of soil erosion for a particular block of land. But vegetation cover is um, the traditional approaches don't really take into account the seasonality of vegetation cover. So that's why um, researchers have moved on from this and try to um, derive new parameterization for um, land cover. And um, here we can use uh, in South Australia the SA land cover dataset, which gives information about different land uses and land cover, and the fractional vegetation cover, which gives you the amount of photosynthetic, non-photosynthetic, and bare soil. So we are really interested in anything growing above the ground, uh, whether it's alive or dead, as opposed to uh, bare soil. And as for uh, erosion control or erosion control practices with um, Landsat or Sentinel near infrared, you can apply what we call a Sobel filter, which is going to highlight any man-made constructions, such as contour ridges. Uh, you can see uh, roads or anything that can slow down water movement along the slope. This model is um, also a dynamic model. So you can have um, erosion estimates through time and not only a ballpark um, value for the whole year. And you can um, include it in uh, automated scripts and use um, GIS softwares. So overall, I've got those two models, one for wind, one for water. And it's creating outputs at a 500 meter resolution. So each pixel is 500 by 500 meters. For the wind erosion, I can look at it from an hourly time step, which I then aggregate to daily, monthly, and annual to um, look at erosion through time. And for water erosion, it goes from monthly to annual. So in the end, what we get is like a 3D array, so multiple layers where we can look at the variability of erosion through space, but also drill down through time for a particular area. And we can also look at um, different erosion hotspots and identify regions that are more frequently impacted by severe erosion. So some of the, some of the results uh, we get out of it is like a long-term annual um, erosion. So we've managed to um, see that a lot of the west coast of the Air Peninsula is frequently impacted, is uh, more susceptible to wind erosion. It's evenly distributed um, around the, the, the Air Peninsula. And water erosion is mostly um, concentrated on hillier regions where you have steeper slopes. From the res those results, we've been able to identify where, um, which regions were more susceptible either to wind or to water erosion, and also where the two processes did overlap. Overall, soil erosion in SA is pretty low. Um, also, it's due to um, an increase in um, conservation practices in agriculture. So um, that, that's also limiting the amount of bare soil you have um, all year round. And as I said before, um, wind erosion is mostly seen on the Air Peninsula on the West Coast, where you have stronger coastal winds and also sandier, lighter soils. So they can be blown more easily uh, away by um, wind and more rainfall erosion on hillier areas. 
it's a little bit redundant maybe, but um, now that we identified those hotspots, we wanted to know how often would they be severely impacted by uh, either wind or water erosion. And um, so west coast of Air Peninsula, um, a little bit around uh, on the western uh, side of Cleve and south of Kimba, or um, more on the joint between the York Peninsula and that mid-north region. But we've noticed uh, when comparing with um, uh, um, experts' knowledge that the wind erosion model predicted erosion in areas that were very unlikely. So that's something I'm actually investigating now. Oh, sorry. Oops. Um, and for water erosion, I, it was the frequency of severe erosion event was pretty low um, in on the Air Peninsula and relatively low on the north, in the mid-north region as well. Again, uh, more in the hillier areas. Looking at the temporal variability of erosion, um, we can um, look at animated maps of um, erosion through time. Uh, for wind, here you've got a daily simulation of uh, wind erosion, and we have similar animations for water. So we can really see how those patterns of erosion are changing uh, through time and through seasons. Another thing we were quite interested about was to see whether those two models, that wind and water erosion model, could capture post-fire um, er change in erosion. For that, we looked at uh, 10 different fire events that occurred between 2001 and 2017. Um, those were located in um, different, affected different landscapes, uh, which can go from cropping, um, cropping landscapes in the Wangari and Pinery area or uh, more native uh, dryland um, landscapes. From, from there, um, the, model, the models did predict uh, an increase in erosion, um, mostly driven by the removal, the total removal of cover, making the soil more uh, susceptible to wind erosion or water erosion if you had an intense storm event. And um, interestingly, some of the regions were impacted by uh, both erosion processes. So meaning there has been some wind and water erosion observed, not necessarily at the same time, but there's going to be wind erosion in one month and the following month, intense storm event, and then you also have water erosion. So that's another um, thing that really advocated for um, the use of those, the study of those two processes together, rather than just looking at one or the other. We also um, investigated the use of um, aerosol optical depth products, so measuring the amount of aerosol in the air and try to correlate that with the amount of dust um, you have after erosion events um, or after fire events, and it seems to correlate to some extent uh, with the wind erosion we've, obser we've observed. But I'll mention, um, I'll talk about it a little bit later on. So I'm doing some modeling and you may, you may have heard before, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And we do believe that this model is useful. Although we won't be able to uh, validate the actual amount of erosion because we don't have um, enough data points. Uh, and we haven't collected um, enough samples on the ground to be able to correlate to the modeling. But we are trying to validate the erosion patterns. So I've used two methods. The first one is to use those aerosol uh, measurements from satellite imagery. And the second one is to compare with, op um, with observations of erosion. So either mentioned in reports or other local data sets. For the comparison with satellite imagery, um, there's a MODIS aerosol optical depth um, data set, which is available globally. And we've used this to um, calculate the frequency of dust, dusty days or the frequency of dust storms and compare those patterns with an overlay analysis with the wind erosion. So on the left hand side, you have the frequency of dust storms and on the right hand side, the modeled wind erosion. 
From the overlay analysis, we were able to explain about 80% of the modeled wind erosion from that, this frequency of the storm. Uh, and all those gray areas um, that you can see on this map are the areas where we knew the models um, predicted erosion where no observation concurred with it. So it's something we're, we're trying to investigate right uh, at the moment as well to see um, why the model didn't perform well in those areas. Um, and we suspect it might be linked to the way um, soil erodibility is included in that wind erosion model. The second validation method we're testing at the moment is to try to compare the model erosion with local observations um, derived from erosion protection field surveys, but also um, from uh, land management reports and um, erosion risk derived um, from satellite imagery. This is work in progress, so I won't be able to talk a lot about it at the moment. I'm doing an APR intern program with the Department for Environment and Water, so to try to look at those aspects. Um, overall, for South Australia, it was pretty important to consider wind and water erosion, especially because some of, um, some of the agricultural region in SA can see a little bit of both, um, also in the Mali region, or at least, um, yeah, um, you, you can also see more wind erosion, but in some instances, especially along riverbanks, you can also see some uh, water erosion. So that's why it's quite important for uh, at least the state of South Australia. Um, the models actually capture pretty well this spatial and temporal variability in erosion, uh, given the um, high temporal frequency of the input data set we're using. And this method is also automated. So the idea in the future is to try to test different climate scenarios as well. Um, that was in my proposal at the beginning, just didn't have enough time to go through it. But it's really something that could be of interest, um, just playing with different rainfall scenarios and ground cover scenarios, et cetera. So overall, those results um, are pretty interesting for land management and also the um, management of um, um, landscapes and like agricultural areas. However, um, this project will need a little bit more work um, before we can actually do a postmortem. Um, we would like to, once the validation is, um, is done, uh, we plan on extending the approach to the rest of the agricultural zone of South Australia. Um, test the influence of climate change and different land management on um, soil loss predictions, and also try to simplify some of those uh, model parameters, um, especially with the in, um, inclusion of crop management and vegetation cover, um, because the model I've used is, has been developed in Europe. There are a few things we still need to um, play with uh, to make it a little bit more adapted to Australian conditions. And also that soil erodibility I mentioned before, especially in the wind model, it's something we're working on at the moment. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening. And also thank you for yeah, um, the university and also the government of South Australia. This project was jointly, jointly developed with the Department for Environment and Water and Tim Herman was my co-supervisor. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Emily. I'm taking over as Jasmine's having some technical issues. So if anyone has any questions, you can ask them in the chat to Emily or just go for it, take yourself off mute and ask Emily directly. I'll probably shoot off with the first one while people are thinking. What, uh, what are some of the challenges with a applying your erosion modeling to different regions. So if someone wanted to apply the models you've done, say in New South Wales or in another country, what would be some of the challenges you could foresee? Um, first off, the, um, so that those two models are developed for cropped, cropped areas um, and they are, lit, they are subtle, subtle uh, differences if you apply to something that's cropped, whereas if you apply to native vegetation of forests, um, I think it's some, um, some things to consider. 
also the um, soil erodibility, uh, how you account for that. Um, the soil texture um, also uh, can be a bit challenging. And having access to uh, reliable data, we are quite fortunate in uh, Australia um, to have very good data set from the Bureau of Meteorology. Also, OSCOVER um, is producing the, or TURN is hosting the fractional vegetation cover developed by the CSIRO. And like, I mean, we have access to reliable data uh, for those large scale assessment. I'm not too sure all countries do have something similar. I know in Europe, they are struggling with fractional vegetation cover. They don't quite have the same algorithm and they're using something that's closely to uh, an NDVI rather than really accounting for this dead and live vegetation. Um, so yeah, because standing stubbles, even though they are not green, they still protect soils. So I think that would be the main um, parameters. Um, I've got a question. Um, I can't remember in the model if um, livestock types or anything like this were are included um, in terms of um, I'm you know obviously uh, hoofed livestock have a effect on the soil and cover and um, compared to say kangaroos and of course the numbers of them have a large effect on the vegetation but I guess you see that effect from vegetation cover. Um, but just uh, the breaking up of the soil and so on. Uh, yeah. Do so, any models take into account that sort of stuff? So first off, the models are not meant for very fine scale um, assessment, or at least the, the ones I ran, uh, you won't see very fine scale assessment. Um, for the grazing impact, you would see it through the fractional vegetation cover, that's for sure. Then again, for, yeah, I think the um, soil compaction could be included, but um, I haven't really looked into it yet. And also for post-fire erosion. So the results I showed you before, um, I just used the models without modification. So for the removal of cover, that would be uh, seen through the fractional vegetation cover. However, um, some studies have shown that the structure of the topsoil does change uh, with fires. You have an increase in uh, water repellency. And I've, I have not accounted for that, um, for um, this um, case study. So yeah, compaction and soil erodibility does, changes, um, does change also if you use conventional agriculture versus conservation. So with no tillage, you're not really working the soil. So you, you would have um, like a lighter kind of texture compared to something that's worked and then is drying out and um, gets wetted again with rainfall. So yeah, these are little things you could tweak, um, but yeah, I haven't looked into it for this particular project. Okay, thanks. Uh, I can ask a question. Uh, am, I, am I unmuted? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, Emily. Uh, congratulations on your PhD and uh, nice talk, thank you. Uh, I guess my question is more technical. Uh, I'm more curious on how the model has been validated in Europe and if it has, and uh, can we do similar validation in Australia to make the model more uh, applicable here? Yeah, so in Europe, they do have a lot of field work um, undertaken. At least, um, yeah, they, they have some um, monitoring stations in France, in Germany, and Italy. So that's how they've mani managed to, and Greece. So that's how they managed to validate those models. In Australia, unfortunately, there was a lot of um, soil erosion monitoring until the 90s, and then it just died out. Mm -hmm. So New South Wales um, has a lot of stations. Uh, I've been in touch with um, some researchers over there and they have the ground data to validate those models. Unfortunately, in SA, we don't. So mm -hmm. that's why, um, like, for now, we, like, I haven't been able to validate those actual, like, amount, but we are quite confident that the, the magnitude in those patterns relates to, um, to what's observed on the ground. So that's why I went for a validation of patterns rather than the actual amount. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you.
Are there any final questions for Emily from the audience? Okay, if not, I'd like to thank you again. <laughs> Congratulations on completing the PhD there, Emily, and getting the sensor lights going. Thank <laughs> you to both of our speakers, Ramesh and Emily. It was great to have you present your science here today. And thank you everyone for joining us. This was the final in our series of three on conservation technology. And... We are now moving to our next series. We are moving to our spring series on diversity. So next week we have Professor Sean Connell presenting on marine biodiversity, uh, marine diversity, as well as another PhD student, Angus Mitchell. So we look forward to joining us next month on the first Friday of September for that first in our series of three on the spring series. Thank you again to all our speakers and thank you for joining us from all around the world. It was great to see everyone joining in from Mumbai, the US, in and around regional South Australia. Thank you all. Hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy your Friday. If you'd like to stay on and have a chat, we can stay here for a little while. If not, see you later. And thanks you for organizing this. It's great. No worries.